All right, guys, so now it is time to talk about the effects of climate change on the ocean. So we're going to just jump right in and talk about ocean warming and ocean acidification. So here we go. Um, all right, so first we're going to talk about ocean warming and then we'll talk about ocean acidification. So you guys might remember from um, chemistry class that each substance has this thing called specific heat. And you might remember that water has a really high specific heat or a really high heat capacity. So that means it takes a lot of energy to warm water. It also means that water can absorb a lot of energy before its temperature changes very much. But that means that atmospheric warming and ocean warming um, are linked. As the atmosphere warms, the ocean warms, but warming the ocean also leads to warming the atmosphere. And once we've warmed the ocean, it takes a long time for it to change. So as our atmosphere warms, we transfer heat to the ocean. And um, the ocean is really good at absorbing the heat that's radiated back to the earth by that greenhouse effect that we've been talking about. So you can see um, we have this trend in ocean heat content. This picture is a little bit backwards of what we're used to looking at. So you can see that all along the eastern coast of the United States, the Atlantic coast where we live, that we have a significant change to the positive or to the higher um, in ocean heat content. Um, and same thing on the eastern coast of Asia as well. Um, and we see very few areas where it is colder. Because water has such a high specific heat, the oceans absorb a lot of the heat that the earth um, has reflected back to it through the greenhouse effect. So 90% of the warming that we have seen in the past 50 years has occurred in oceans. So we talked a little bit about thermohaline circulation. And so we'll come back to that. The thermohaline circulation is that circulation driven by differences in salinity and differences in temperature where the warmer water gets distributed away from the poles as it um, reaches the, um, sorry, it moves away from the equator and towards the poles. And as it reaches the poles, it tends to go down deeper and that changes the heat circulation. That distributes that heat that's absorbed at the surface down into the depths of the ocean, but it also distributes it around the earth. Because the ocean has such a high specific heat, whatever heat it absorbs, it has a lot of heat for a small temperature change. And so that amount of heat can be transferred back to the atmosphere for decades. It's important to distinguish between heat and temperature because temperature is a measurement of kinetic energy. Heat is the ability to transfer that energy. So how does this affect the things that live in the ocean? Well, as we've been talking about repeatedly through our water, unit, warmer water holds less oxygen. So um, lower dissolved oxygen can cause respiratory stress or suffocation of those marine organisms. Another major impact is that migratory routes and mating seasons can be altered, um, especially for our marine mammals. Um, reproductive timing is often tied to temperature change and can be altered by um, this change in, um, in temperatures. Also, a lot of organisms that live in the ocean um, are their gender balance, their sex balance is determined by temperature when the eggs are hatched um, or when the eggs are being incubated. And so this is also leading to um, a disproportion in the sexes of the organisms. Um, so where are we? No, there we go. All right. Um, and then of course, 
we also have a lot of habitat loss. Um, as the ocean gets warmer, corals bleach. That means that they lose their algae, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. But that the corals are a habitat for many, many other species. Um, and so this is a significant issue, not just for the coral themselves, but for the other organisms that depend on the corals for a habitat. And then corals grow in shallow, sunny waters because they depend on the photosynthesis performed by algae that live within them. Um, as the sea level rises, the areas become deeper. That means there's less solar penetration and that may mean that the corals can no longer live there. Um, another significant effect is that warmer water um, tends to promote the growth of blue-green algae, which are toxic. Um, and the warm temperature prevents the mixing of water and because warmer water is less dense, so it tends to stay on the top instead of sinking down. And that also enables these algae blooms because that warm water is near the surface and getting lots of light. And so um, we get these toxic blue-green algae blooms. And this is a picture of the blue-green algae. Some of you might have heard uh, news stories recently about dogs drinking water that contain toxic blue-green algae and um, dying as a result. This also happens to marine animals. You also can have blue-green algae blocking the sunlight, which is going to prevent the growth of any other algae or any bottom-dwelling photosynthetic organisms. Um, and when it decomposes, then it can also lead to hypoxia or that dead zone. Okay, now let's focus on coral reefs. So, Climate change dramatically affects these coral reef ecosystems. As the ocean gets warmer, the corals are subjected to what we call thermal stress, um, and that causes them to lose their algae. The algae prefer, the algae that live in corals prefer colder water, so they'll actually abandon the corals in warmer water, leaving the corals without a food source. Um, it also promotes the um, transfer of disease from corals. Um, sedimentation can actually kind of smother the coral as the sea floor also rises. Um, these changes, the increased intensity of storms as well as the increased frequency of storms can cause um, destruction of the reef structure. Uh, when we have more fresh water running off, that changes the salinity of the water. It may also bring in uh, more land-based pollutants, which is going to cause issues for the corals. Um, corals breed by spawning, um, and so they rely on ocean currents to carry that the spawn, the larvae, away from where those corals are and establish new corals. Um, so if we lose those ocean currents, then the larvae can't be dispersed. And then we're gonna talk about ocean acidification in just a minute. So let's talk about coral bleaching. So coral reefs are actually a great example of mutualistic relationships. We have coral and we have these zooxanthellae, um, which are photosynthetic algae. The algae supply sugar to the corals and the corals supply carbon dioxide and organic matter and a location, safe location for these algae. So the algae have a very narrow temperature tolerance range. And so if the temperature rises outside of their range of tolerance, they either leave the reef or they die. And either way, we're left with coral without any algae, so without a source of food. Um, these zooxanthellae are also sensitive to many of the organic pollutants, so pesticides and sunscreen, and so that can also cause issues with the algae. Without the algae, the corals don't have a food source. Uh, they become stressed and they become much more vulnerable to disease. 
Okay, so that was um, ocean warming. Let's talk about ocean acidification. So another major aspect of climate change when it comes to oceans is this idea of ocean acidification. So the more carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere, the more carbon dioxide we're gonna have in the ocean. Um, solubility depends on pressure. So as we have a higher pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, meaning we have more of it in the atmosphere, we're gonna have an increased amount of it dissolved in the water as well. So it's a direct relationship. Our carbon dioxide in water combines with the water to form carbonic acid. So as carbon dioxide in the air increases more, there's also an increase in carbon dioxide in the water that leads to an increase in concentration of carbonic acid. Now the carbonic acid is a weak acid, but it still dissociates into the bicarbonate ion and the hydrogen ion. So it increases the acidity of the ocean that lowers its pH. And hopefully from chemistry, you guys remember that a pH of seven is neutral. It means that we have equal amounts of acids and bases, equal amounts of hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion. Traditionally, the ocean is actually very slightly alkaline, usually with a pH of around 8.2. Um, so slightly alkaline. And that works out well for the organisms that live in the ocean because many Anything that builds a shell and lives in the ocean relies on something called carbonate ions, which are not the HCO3, that's bicarbonate ion, but this CO3 2 minus, that's the carbonate ion. Um, and the carbonate ions, the organisms that build shells, build their shells out of calcium carbonate. So the more carbonate there is in the ocean, the easier it is for corals and mollusks and snails and all the other marine calcifiers or shell building organisms for them to build their shells. So unfortunately, because carbonic acid is a weak acid, as the ocean becomes more acidic, um, it actually makes those carbonate ions less available because those carbonate ions are actually gonna bond with the hydrogen to increase carbonic acid even more. So as carbonate ions become less available at this lower pH, so when pH lowers, we have fewer carbonate ions available and that makes it much harder for the organisms to collect enough Cal uh, carbonate from the seawater to build their shells. Um, at the same time, carbonate ions are also part of what neutralizes or makes more basic the ocean. And so that is continuing to consume more carbonate ions and increase the acidity or decrease the alkalinity of ocean water. When we have carbonic acid, we increase the hydrogen ions, which bond with carbonate to form the bicarbonate. So um, two impacts. One is that it is harder for the organisms to collect the carbonate to build their shells, but it also, acidity breaks down calcium carbonate. Um, so if you guys remember ever in lower school, or maybe I don't think we did it in chemistry, um, adding acid to chalk, you can see that it bubbles. So even if you just pour vinegar on chalk, or if you think about the reaction between vinegar and sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, you know that it bubbles and reacts. And that process is what's happening to these marine organisms in the ocean, that the acid actually dissolves their shells. And so it makes them more vulnerable to predators as well. We have weaker corals, weaker mollusks, weaker urchins, weaker snails. Anything that builds a shell has a um, weaker shell and has a harder time growing larger. So you can see this is the image of a sea snail shell in a solution of a pH of 7.8. Um, and you can see how quickly it's deteriorating. 
So where's the carbon dioxide coming from? Hopefully at this point we know that it is largely from fossil fuel combustion and deforestation, but we also have an increase in the acidification of the ocean from our acid rain, which is coming from the nitrous oxides and the sulfur dioxide from um, combustion of coal and gas. That increase in carbon dioxide is directly correlated with ocean acidification. So as atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration goes up, the pH of the ocean goes down. So you can see that although there is an up and down here, the general trend is heading down. In the last 150 years, our ocean pH has gone from 8.2 to 8.1. It could decrease all the way to 7.8 by 2100. Um, you might remember that picture of the snail shell was in pH of 7.8. Remember that pH is a logarithmic scale, so that one-tenth change in pH is a 30% decrease in um, the alkalinity of the water, or a 30% increase in the acid nature of the water. Okay, and we'll end here. As always, if you have any questions, let me know.